Hi, my name is Lupa and I'm one of the presenters for the Magic and Ecology uh, conference. And I was asked to do a brief presentation to give you a little bit of an idea of my angle on the topic and uh, you know, get you interested in our panel that's coming up. So just a little bit about me. Um, I live on the coast of Southwest Washington in the United States. Uh, I live on a farm that's owned by a couple of my friends. I've been here the last two years and I am the primary caretaker of the various animals that we have here when, uh, you know, when the owners aren't here because they work out of town during the week. And we have, let's see, we have sheep, we have chickens, we have several different types of waterfowl. Uh, we have my co-presenter Pika over here. Um, so you might see her get up and wander around a little bit. And uh, this is my beautiful art studio. I'm also an artist. I work with uh, hides and bones and uh, other natural and found materials. I also, just for the fun of it, customize model horses. You might see some of those on the table back there. So this is going to be a very informal presentation, as you can probably tell, this being the year of Zoom, thanks to the pandemic. So a little bit about me and my background. Um, I have been pagan for just about a quarter of a century. Uh, I am not indigenous. I'm a white girl from the Midwest U.S. and I come from a very non-indigenous sort of Wicca-based neo-pagan background, although I've dabbled in all sorts of different paths over the years from chaos magic to neo-shamanism. And these days I consider myself to be a naturalist pagan, which means that I tend to look at the world few, through a very naturalist lens as opposed to a supernatural one. Uh, my formal background, uh, I have a bachelor's in English. I've written several books on paganism and related topics. And my master's degree is in counseling psychology with an additional certificate and emphasis in eco-psychology. Uh, that's the psychology of why we're connected to nature, how we're connected to nature, and how the natural world is good for us. And that's going to really inform a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. So that's a little bit about me. If you want to find out more, you can go to thegreenwolf.com. Not greenwolf.com, thegreenwolf. Uh, that's got more information on me, on my writing, on my art, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a contact form. So if you want to email me, you are welcome to. I love talking shop. So I wanted to talk a little bit about why we might be seeking magic uh, especially in these times. You know, 2020 has been an absolutely, for us anyway, unprecedented year. Now, historically, you can look back and see years where there have been plagues, where there have been political upheavals, uh, where there have been environmental crises, and where these things have converged. But it, it kind of feels like to us, especially, you know, here in the United States, where we, especially since the Second World War, we've been so insulated from you know, problems, at least we think we've been, that all of a sudden having that veneer of safety and security falling down around us, um, for those of us who are pri privileged enough to be able to think that was there, it's been really unsettling. So yeah, we've got this global coronavirus pandemic and all the upheaval with that. We have deep political schisms that have had their roots uh burrowing through decades of time, but they're really coming to the surface, especially over the last few years uh, with, the, with the current outgoing administration. And of course, we've got the big bugaboo of climate change. Uh, and that's really, I think to me, the, the, the biggest, scariest one because it has the greatest implications. And I think a lot of people aren't necessarily focusing on that because it's so big and it, because it feels so incredibly overwhelming. So all any single one of these things would be absolutely difficult for anybody to deal with. It's stressful, it's scary, it's anxiety provoking. Some people have found themselves dealing not just with more anxiety, but more depression. 
And it's completely understandable. Um, and then to think about having all three of these hitting at once, it's no wonder so many people are feeling stressed and out of control. So when times are difficult, people will seek control over their circumstances in any way that they can. Uh, some of these are healthy. Some of these are maladaptive or unhealthy. We've seen this manifest in everything from personal coping skills. Again, some of them are really good and healthy and um, keep us uh, rejuvenated and re as, as relaxed as we can get. Some of them really do help. Some of them are maladaptive. Uh, addiction, for example, is an example of a, of a maladaptive coping mechanism. Now, it might be something that has felt like it's worked in the past, but over the long term, obviously, the uh, problems outweigh any benefits. So we're seeing this manifest through personal coping mechanisms. We're seeing this upheaval and this desire for control uh, manifest through actions like protests. You know, these protests that people have been participating in, not just in the last few years, but throughout history. Every single one of those is a big collective uh, expression of a desire for a change, a change for what they see as the better. And so for me, it's been really heartening to see people feel that they have enough of a voice to speak up. Um, the effects of, you know, the, the, the response, of course, from whoever they're protesting against varies. And unfortunately, it's not always what we hope would happen. But it's good to see that people haven't just, you know, laid down and given up. So my, my heart goes out to everybody who has the health and that to be out protesting, um, and magic, you know, I, again, I've been, I've been pagan for 25 years and I have seen so many different ways in which members of the pagan community and the occult community and other surrounding communities have used magic, not just to influence their personal lives, but to try to influence the world around them. And again, it's a way to try to affect change and gain some control over what can be a really seemingly out of control situation. Now, a really cynical person might say that this belief is childish, that's just magical thinking in, in a rational way. And it's a response to seemingly unknown forces in a chaotic universe and gosh, it must not do anything because, you know, lighting that candle isn't actually going to bring this person back to health, blah, 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 blah. So that's the cynic's viewpoint. My view is a little different and a little more nuanced. As I said, I'm a naturalist about things. I don't see things from a supernatural perspective, but I think there's more nuance between very strictly material and way out on the other end of magical thinking where people are convinced that their every action has an invisible reaction, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a few different ways that, that I've seen people interpret magic and their, you know, their experiences with the spiritual world over the years. Some people take a very literal view of the supernatural. Some people say believe that there are literal spirits and deities and other such beings and that we as practitioners can interact with them whether through placating them or through making bargains with them or through creating relationships with them etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's one interpretation there's also the purely psychological perspective in which uh we see these beings and magic and so forth as emanations of our psychological viewpoint. So there, it's all in our head. It's a very vibrant, alive, um, personally meaningful uh, mental and emotional landscape. You know, maybe it doesn't exist outside of our heads, but it has a lot of value to us internally in giving us more of a structure for meaning making. And then there's the idea, and this is kind of, you know, this kind of makes up a lot of the continuum between that very literal and that very, you know, metaphorical perspective. And that's the connection with something greater than the self. 
Uh, and that's what a lot of, of spirituality is, is this desire to connect with something greater than who we are as individuals, whether that's the greater humanity or the greater biome of the earth or the, the greaterness of, God, that's a word, greaterness, um, of the divine. Uh, pardon me, I'm a little bit tired. We have a little baby bottle lamb that we're having to bottle feed here on the farm, and it involves being up, you know, waking up in the middle of the night to make sure she gets fed. So we're all a little sleep deprived here. So if I make up words as I go along, please forgive me. Anyway, um, I think that also the connection to something greater than the self fuels a desire to interact with one's physical environment in meaningful ways. And that's where we get into the ecology of this. And I really like this because it allows for both that literal and that metaphorical interpretation and all points in between. Uh, and I'm gonna leave the rest of the discussion completely open to your interpretation. You know, there's no single right answer and I want you to be able to get the most out of this regardless of how you view the, the macrocosm. Um, I want to focus on magic as a way to connect more deeply with the natural world. That's not the only purpose of magic, but that's what I'm looking at for our topic today. So I want to talk a little bit about eco-psychology. I talked about that a minute ago when I was talking about my background. So eco-psychology, as I said, it's the psychology of how we relate to nature, why we need nature to be healthy, and how exposure to non-human nature is good for us. So we evolved in big open areas, big natural landscapes that did not have a lot of human uh, tinkering, um, especially early on in our species and our ancestors' development, um, especially in the, in the species prior to our discovery of how to make fire. So even if you go back as far as, for example, Australopithecus, uh, when we first start, you know, when our ancestors first started walking upright, et cetera, et cetera, as the forests broke up and there was more open savanna in between, we really started imprinting uh, this idea of big open spaces, big open views with little patches of trees. That really became what we came to expect as home. And that has carried down to us Homo sapiens sapiens today. We still have something in our head that says these big open spaces where we can see clean water, where we can see danger coming from a long way away, and where we have a safe haven to go to, that really speaks to us. And it's a big organic uh, field with a lot of organic shapes. So this whole thing where we live in boxes, you know, even my studio has a lot of straight planes and a lot of straight lines and a lot of, you know, human made structures that have, you know, very little resemblance to much of what you see in the rest of nature. And we've only really had uh, especially if you look at this very strictly boxy way of living things, we've, we've only had maybe, you know, several centuries to maybe a few millennia to adjust to that way of living. And shape is just part of it. There's also stimulus. So look at the, look at the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the part of our, of our nervous system that responds to danger. And so let's say I am, you know, a, uh, an early Homo sapiens sapiens living in the African savanna. And most of the time, my attention is not going to be grabbed by dangerous things. You know, dangers are kind of few and far between most of the time. It's not like there's a lion around every single bush or every single tree. It's something that does happen, but it's not a constant thing. You know, we're not having to constantly pay attention. Eh, 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 eh. You know, most of the time, my attention flows organically. Oh, hey, there's some food over there. Oh, hey, look, you know, there's a member of my family. Or, oh, wow, look at that bird flying overhead. 
it's more of a flow of attention. And let's compare that to when I was living full time in Portland and I'd be walking in downtown Portland and there's a lot going on. There's a lot of stimuli. There's all this traffic going around. There's cars here. There's cars there. I'm getting to an intersection and I want to cross the intersection. I have to make sure this car over here doesn't run the red light and run me over. I have to make sure this guy who's about to, you know, turn right on red doesn't, you know, forget that I'm here and hit me. Uh, there's a person over here trying to get my attention. There's some billboards here. There's a bus over there that, you know, just let its, uh, you know, let the brakes go a little too hard and it's screech, you know, it's screeching a little bit. And then maybe there's somebody yelling over here. And it's really exhausting because there's all these really loud, noisy things vying for my attention. And I have to pay to pay attention to it all at once. And it's not just walking down the street. It's all the attention that we have to pay when we're at work, when we're driving places, when we're navigating public transit. It's exhausting. It really is. And so there's a wonderful concept for that more organic flowing way of attention that we evolved with. And it comes from the, the, the conservation biologists and researchers, uh, not come biologists, conservation psychologists, Rachel and Stephen Kaplan. Uh, and it's called soft fascination, soft fascination. And it's, it's a great term for that very organic way of viewing the world that we evolved with over millions of years as hominids. And so most of us prior, a lot of us prior to the pandemic spent a lot of time out of soft fascination because we have all these pressures, all these stimuli, you know, everything again from traffic to advertisements to lots of people bugging us and even more with email and phones. It's, you know, that exhausting. And a lot of us have found, especially with the pandemic and especially during shutdowns, when we're prevented from dealing with a lot of this uh, stuff, you know, we no longer commute. We no longer, maybe, you know, maybe we do with some email, but we're doing it from the comfort of home and we can walk away a little bit more easily. Obviously, your mileage may vary, but a lot of us have found that in that quiet space, we've been able to reconnect with things outside of that rat race life. We've discovered, we discovered our hobbies or new hobbies. We've discovered rest. We've just rediscovered maybe our connection to nature, even if it's just something as simple as putting a bird feeder out in the yard and be able to watch that. And with nature in particular, we've reconnected in more positive ways than just the negative headlines that we get. You know, a lot of people, their main connection to nature is through the headlines, headlines about climate change, headlines about pollution, headlines about habitat loss. And so getting to stop for a moment and actually go outside, even if it's just in your yard, and experience nature in a more positive, direct way is really healing. Not just because it's what we evolved with, but because it's a positive, it's recreating that positive connection rather than just the bad headline connection. And we remember that nature can be a wonderful stress reliever, not just that source of stress. When I go outside, there are a number of physiological and psychological things that happen, and these are measurable. A, after a few minutes, my blood pressure drops. My breathing becomes more even. If I'm exercising, even if it's just walking or doing yoga, you know, endorphins are beginning to flow in my brain. Um, heart rates will go, you know, resting heart rates will drop. And I just get a sense of feeling better. And that's that way for most people. So... This opportunity that we've had to reconnect with nature in a really positive way has been one of the silver linings of the pandemic. And so to bring that back to nature um, and magic, when we know more about something, when it's more familiar to us and it's more connected to us, we care about it more deeply. And awareness brings engagement. And I've been seeing this resurgent, resurgence and in interest in magic, not just during the pandemic, but even before that, 
you know, magic and pagan paths and spiritual paths, I'm seeing that as a manifestation of the desire for engagement that comes about from being more aware of what's going on around us and the deep desire to solve these problems, not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of other beings, human and otherwise. Look at how many efforts there have been in the past few years to use magic towards influencing political and social movements for the betterment of others. Look at how many rituals have been done, uh, even if it's something for as sort of vague and general as healing the earth, or as something very specific as wanting to uh, influence the outcome of a vote that would determine whether a piece of land is protected from development or not. Or all the magic done to try to stop the um, oil pipeline going through the Dakotas and impact, negatively impacting indigenous lands. Look at how many pagans and occultists and other people want to incorporate the elements of nature, things like herbs and stones and bones and natural water into their spells and charms and rituals, not just for their own personal gratification, but also so that they can learn more about this amazing world that we're a part of. I look at this trend. I look at how it's been on the rise in recent years, especially as the internet has allowed us to connect more uh, and to share more ideas. You know, I became a pagan at about the same time that I discovered the internet in the mid 1990s. And you know, starting with chat rooms and then moving to live journal and now Facebook and other social media, um, I've been able to see this growth in connectivity and the sharing of ideas and the sharing of, of um, efforts. And I think so much of this is driven by people wanting to create positive change in the world. And again, not just for themselves, but for others. <laughs> but what any good witch or pagan or occultist is going to tell you, it's that you have to back up your magic with more mundane actions. You can't just do a spell and then do nothing to support it, whether that's to get a job or to do healing or to influence some sort of activist work. Now, obviously, some people, you know, according to disability or chronic illness or time or other restrictions, may not have the ability to go out on the front lines and protest or do a whole bunch, you know, plant a garden or whatever. But what you may find is they might, you might just have enough energy to write a letter or to share their information with someone else or to urge others to do this action that will help. So we're seeing more people engaged in social change in the ways that they are able. We see pagans and other people involved in the protests and the cleanups and the letter writing campaigns and even increasingly in running for political office. We're seeing more of a drive toward inclusion at pagan and other events. We're trying to make these things more friendly to, pe to people of color, to people who are disabled, and to other people of, you know, who are minorities of various sorts. It doesn't always work perfectly, but we're trying. We're seeing education about how to be good stewards of the land. If you're going to use natural items in your practice, how do you do so sustainably? Uh, and in many cases where pagans are able to buy land, whether it's for their own personal use or whether they want to make a sanctuary for others to use, they work toward returning it to more suitable wildlife habit. They might use it for sustainable agriculture, working to build the soil health back and permaculture and things like that. So we're seeing more people walk their talk. Now, obviously, everybody can come up with, you know, instances where that's not the case, where people are just all talk and no action, but I'm optimistic. I'm seeing this change. I'm seeing where people are motivated to be better and make things better for themselves and more importantly, for others. So I'm really heartened to see that. And I see the return to magic 
however you want to uh, interpret magic, whether it's literal spells, whether it's psychological, you know, practices or some combination thereof. I see it as another tool in the kit of these people who want to make the world a better place. Even those who don't take it literally are going to see these rituals and practices as ways to affirm their intention in their own mind and maybe to state to others, this is what I am doing and to psych themselves up for action. And it imbues our actions, these practices, these beliefs, these statements, they imbue our actions with even more purpose and they add a layer of spiritual and mythological beauty to the mundane. Most importantly, all this helps to create and maintain a sense of meaning for our lives and what we do with them in our brief once in a lifetime opportunities to be part of this world right here, right now. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening. If you have any questions, go to thegreenwolf.com and go to the contact page and you're welcome to contact me there. Thank you very much and looking forward to my panel with, uh, with Gusto.